Praise God. What a sense of his presence. Amen. Amen. It's true. You preach back at me. This is two-way this morning. What a sense of his presence. Aren't we rich people? You and me were rich in God this morning. It's true. The love, the grace, the goodness. I want to share with you today uh, just something out of the scriptures. And um, to me, I think it's, it's just something that the Holy Spirit has been putting on my heart for, uh, for a while, for a couple of weeks. And I just want to share it with you. And um, I just pray that it really just meets you uh, in, in uh, it right where you are. You know, God wants to do a work by the Spirit here. You know that it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. You know that, right? It's the anointing. It's the Holy Spirit's power. And that's what we want this morning. Uh, Let's just pray together. Lord, I just thank you this morning, God, for your mercy, for your grace, for your love, Jesus, that that it just goes beyond what we could believe or, or, or comprehend on our own, God. We need the Holy Spirit to come and open our eyes again to how deep your love is for us. Lord, I just pray for every heart and every life, God, that there would be an outflow, Lord Jesus, of your presence, Lord, uh, and, and it would touch every life, and it would lift every head, and it would give courage where there is none, strength where there is none, hope where there is none, and it would reignite faith again in our lives, God, for it is faith that pleases you. It's faith that you desire, and we pray that you would come and you would move in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. So uh, I want to talk to you today, uh, uh, maybe uh, the best way to title the message is let it go to let it grow. Okay, say it with me, let it go to let it grow. Let it go to let it grow. So uh, I've been in the book of Philippians, uh, just just in my personal, just reading and stuff like that. So I will be basing it off a text, and I'll just read now. Philippians 3, uh, uh, verse 1. Knowing Christ above all else. This is the Apostle Paul writing uh, from a jail cell in in Rome, probably about 62 AD, writing to a church in Philippi, and this is what he's saying. Finally, my brothers... Rejoice in the Lord. Say rejoice. Rejoice. That word rejoice and joy, it shows up about 16 times uh, in four chapters. Paul certainly had found something even in a jail cell. Uh, Rejoice in the Lord. Uh, To write the same thing to you is no trouble to me and it is safe for you. Verse 2, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Verse 3, for we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ. Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Uh, Verse 4, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Look at verse 7, church. Listen, but whatever was an asset to me, I count as loss for the sake of knowing Christ. More than that, I count all things, all things as loss compared to the surpassing excellence of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to him in his death and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained this or am already being perfect, perfected, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself to have yet laid hold of it, but listen to this church, and I really want to really want to sit here. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining toward lies what lies ahead what is ahead i press on toward the goal to win the prize of god's heavenly calling in christ jesus look at verse 15 
all of us who are mature should embrace this point of view. And if you think differently about some issue, God will reveal this to you as well. Nevertheless, we must live up to what we have already attained. Amen. Okay, so Paul and Silas first visited Philippi. Uh, this is in Greece uh, during Paul's second missionary journey, uh, which occurred probably between 49 and 51 AD. Uh, Philippi was the location of the first Christian community here in Europe. It was the first one. Biblical scholars agree that it was Paul who wrote the letter, Paul of Tarsus, while he was in prison. So this is one of Paul's prison epistles. I want us to understand this, that Paul is expressing joy unspeakable from a jail cell. Paul is talking about joy. Paul has found the type of joy that has nothing to do with his situation or surroundings, any sensation that he had. Paul had a joy that was unshakable and immovable. That was the joy that Paul was talking about. That was, that was the heart through which Paul was writing this letter. You know, I want to talk... I want to talk about this here. You know, you, know, you, you, you see this, this saying... Those who are mature should think this way. Those who are mature should think this way. I want to talk about a frame of mind this morning. I want to talk about a frame of mind that pertains to maturity. Uh, Paul, is talking about the, uh, uh, Paul is talking about a perspective or a way of viewing the Christian race, particularly your past and, uh, and what lies ahead in the things of God. Okay, so I want you to know that, I want you to say that that's, that's what I want to look at this morning. Paul is saying that there is a way of looking at the race that we're running. There's a way of looking at things that have come to pass and a way of looking forward to things that lie ahead. That's mature. That's, that's of a mature disposition, if you want. Uh, God wants you and I to rightly assess the past in view of the future. Amen? That's what God wants us to do. Paul called it rubbish compared to knowing him, being found in him, and finishing the race. Okay, so when we look at verse 3 of this, Paul contends for the Philippians. Uh, the Philippians have had to deal with some, um, so the Judaizers had, co had come into the church. And what they were trying to argue was that uh, people had to undergo physical circumcision, okay, to be made right with God. Uh, but Paul, Paul challenged that idea straight away. This is what he said. He said that we are the circumcision, we are the covenant people. His response to this idea that the Philippians had to do something to be made right with God was no, come back to promise. We're a covenant people. We've come into this thing through promise. We've been cut out from the world and the world has been cut out from us. Paul started to talk straight away about what the root of the Philippians confidence was. Where are you laying your confidence? Okay. Where are you laying your confidence? Uh, the root of our confidence and our worship was not in, is not in ourselves. It's in Christ. Amen. That's what he was saying. He was saying the, where, the, where you place your confidence matters. The root of your confidence, the, where you decide to build your confidence on, should not be in yourself, but it should be in Christ. But Paul makes a distinction that you and I should make as well between those who put their trust in their flesh and those who do not. And the question is there again, church, where do we lay our confidence? Where have you put your confidence? There's a link between where we place our confidence and true heart worship. Paul wanted to make a distinction between doing and trusting. There's a difference between those who do to be made right and those who trust. And God meets those who trust with his spirit's presence and true heart worship. In other words, church, confidence is currency. Say that with me. Confidence is currency. The issue of confidence is the root of what Paul is really saying in this passage. It's about confidence. Where we place our confidence uh, will tell us how that confidence will hold in trial. Where we place our confidence, where we decide to root our confidence will tell us whether that confidence is going to last when tough times happen, when hard things happen. Verse 13, Paul brings it to this. But one thing that I do is I forget what lies behind and I strain forward to what lies ahead. Paul is saying that this road to placing or rooting our confidence, there's one thing that I do, I forget what lies behind and I strain forward. 
And I want to break this down here, church. There is a principle that we need to understand because I think there's something that you and I can take and use in our spiritual lives here. Paul says that he forgets what lies behind. Everybody's got a past. We all have a past. But listen, Paul says we have to forget what lies behind. Paul told uh, told the Philippians, I was a Jew of Jews, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee. I was all of these things. I now count them as rubbish. I'm forgetting what lies behind. Um, That word forgetting actually means to lose out of mind or to neglect. That's what Paul is saying. He says, when I forget what lies behind, I am literally neglecting it. I'm neglecting this, okay? It's a decision to place our mind's eye, our attention away from past things. Uh, It's a decision to place our mind's eye or our attention away from past things. Paul had been positionally saved out of these things. We know that story that God revealed himself to Saul of Tarsus, to Paul while he was on that road to Damascus. God met Paul. And in a moment, God saved Paul out of religion, out of, this, uh, out, out of, a, uh, out of everything that he considered of value. Um, but Paul said that there was another work that had to happen. Paul had been positionally saved out of these things. He'd been taken out of his past, but there was a work that had to be done to take his past out of him do you know that that while God has saved us and delivered us from our past there's also a work to take our past out of us we've been taken out of our past but there is such there is a letting go and there is a forgetting what lies behind because God wants to take your past out of you okay Um, he had to forget former things and it's funny, that word forget, what, what it actually means is the power of these things has been broken at the cross, but they can still hold a dominion in the mind. Does that make sense? That although you've been saved from your past, although you've been set free from your past, although you've been liberated from your past, they can still, your past can still hold a dominion in your mind. And this is really what Paul wants to deal with here. He wants to deal with the dominion that the past can have upstairs in the mind. And when he says what lies behind, it's interesting, he's making a general statement about past things, your past, your history, what you've come from, what God has saved you out of. But actually, a better way to understand what he's saying is this. It can be contextualized in the context of the Christian race. In other words, forgetting the things that as a believer, I once put my confidence in. That's actually what Paul is saying. That yes, my my past my past in general, but it's actually the things that I'm growing out of as a believer. The things that in my, as I've run this race, that I used to put my confidence in that I don't anymore. Uh, Forgetting those things, attitudes, actions, failures even, philosophies, putting them down, abandoning them, striving like an athlete. That word striving, it literally means like an athlete throwing themselves forward with all their strength, okay? With all our might toward the things that pertain to salvation. That's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that there is, there is this process of letting go of the things that we used to love and we used to do and we used to believe even as Christians and striving forward for the things that pertain to salvation. Running forward to take hold of the things for which Christ has taken hold of us. Paul set his mind on the things that were above, the things that pertain to salvation and he did it actively. He sought out to actively lay hold of the things for which Christ laid hold of him. The words forgetting and striving imply active faith on our part. It's an active thing, church, for you and for me to forget the things that we used to do, the the, the way we used to be, and to press forward to the things that we know from the word of God are right and true for us to believe and us to pursue This is intentional. The continual putting down of what is dead and gone by picking up what is alive in the gospel. That's what Paul is saying. That there is a putting down of the things that the gospel has called dead in our lives and picking up the things that Christ has purchased for us. And this begins in our minds. It begins in our minds. That's what he's saying. 
We bend toward the things that Paul described of his past self. We bend towards self-sufficiency. We run from faith and not toward it, church. We have to recognize this about ourselves. We bend away from faith, not towards it. Through faith, we've obtained everything that we have in Jesus. Amen. It's through faith. But it's also through faith that we will obtain and walk in the fullness of promise. It's through faith. It's through faith. And so there's this tension where we will naturally bend towards self-sufficiency. Yet God is calling us not to trust in ourselves, but to trust in him. Okay, so I want to just break some things down here. Paul, Paul had direction. Paul, you see, Paul had a mindset that I believe that God wants us all to begin to walk in. And you can see some of, the, some of it uh, had to do with direction. Paul had a right perspective in God. He had a right perspective. He had the perspective that you and I ought to have. Paul said, I'm pressing forward into faith. I'm pushing deeper into trust. I'm pushing away from human endeavor, strength of will, deeper into the power of God. I'm forgetting that history, that life where I used to try and build on my own strength, my own holiness, my own will, all of that stuff that I used to do when I was a man in religion and I'm putting it down and I'm setting it to the side and I'm forgetting it and I'm actively picking up the truth of the cross that there is no other strength other than what God gives me through faith in his son. There is no other way. There is no other way. Paul considered everything that was not faith rubbish. Everything that was not faith. God delivered this man from an economy of thought. Delivered him from a value system that said somehow the status of religion mattered. God set him free. Paul, the only thing that matters is faith in me. Not where you were born, when you were circumcised, not what you did, not your observance under the law, not your blameless, uh, perfect track record in religion, but your trust in me. That's all that matters, Paul. The empty exercise of religion, a righteousness from the law that gave a veneer of status, comfort, and life, but it was slavery, Righteousness that did not flow explicitly from faith in Christ alone, Paul wanted no part of. It was rubbish to him. His eyes were opened. The only thing that mattered was the trust relationship he had with God through Christ. So Paul had direction. I'm going toward faith. I'm going toward faith, deeper trust. I'm leaning more and more of my weight on God, on what he says, on what he's promised and what he's done. And I'm moving away from the self-sufficiency of religion. God saved me out of religion. Now he's taking that religion out of me. I'm putting it down. I'm forgetting it. I'm actively neglecting it. And I'm striving forward with all my strength to faith, toward faith. Paul had direction. He had perspective. Secondly, Paul had desire. He had the right appetites. This perspective gave him the right appetites. His desire was to partake in the power of the resurrection by identifying with Christ in suffering. That's what he wanted. I want resurrection life. Paul wrote it to the Philippians. This is what I want. My desire, what I'm throwing my life into is more resurrection power, more resurrection life. I want to be conformed to him in his death. I want to know the victory of Christ over death in my own life. That's what Paul wanted. I want to be like him. I don't just want to name him. I don't just want to, 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 to represent him. I want to reflect him. I don't just want to come in the name of God. I want people to see my life and see Jesus in me. 
I want to walk like he walked. I want to suffer like he suffered. I want to die like he died. And I know I'll rise as he rose. That's what Paul wanted. Paul saw the past self-sufficiency as death and there was no resurrection from it. Paul knew it was better to identify with Jesus and suffer as he suffered because he knew him and he walked with him in the fire. Paul wanted to move away from the immaturity of religion. He said religion is immature. Self-sufficiency is immaturity. It's way of thinking. The faithlessness of ritual. The man-centeredness of it. Paul desired to move away from a righteousness that had no power to bring him into conformity with Christ. He weighed everything against this. Everything. Paul's new value system was simple. Resurrection life and conformity with Christ. If it doesn't bring that, it's rubbish. If that is not the end of this, it is rubbish. Whatever I do, whatever I throw my weight into, my perspective is this. If it doesn't bring me into a true conformity with Jesus, it's rubbish. It's rubbish. If it doesn't bring resurrection life, it's rubbish. These were the markers against which everything was weighed. Paul also recognized that the road to maturity was a process. Amen. Growing up, I'm 33 next week. I know I don't look it. <laughs> 33 next week. It happened like that, right? Happened like that. I went to the barber the other day and uh, he, he, he broke it to me in the best way that he could that I'm starting to thin on top. That's why my long flowing locks have been sheared down to what they are now. That's why I'm compensating with facial hair. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> this is this growing old my, my wonderful wife uh, you know she's so good but I, I know those grey hairs are there and she, she won't let me she, she, won't, she, won't, she won't she won't acknowledge them but she does too we're getting on we're all growing but let me tell you something age, age and maturity uh, don't conflate the two don't conflate the two you can be immature and old and you can be young and have maturity there are different things there are different things. Often they go together, but not necessarily. But maturing is a process. It's the heart of God that we reach full maturity as sons and as daughters. He said as sons and as daughters, you can't separate sonship from maturity. You just can't. Those who are mature amongst us are those who are walking in the fullness of sonship, the fullness of daughterhood. Yet Paul recognized that this was a process. The shedding of what was immature for maturity. Full faith and trust in Christ. He had not attained it yet, but he sought to not to hold on to anything that lay behind, but to strive toward what lay ahead. The goal? A life lived fully trusting God in all circumstances. No reliance on flesh whatsoever. Knowing him in suffering. Walking with him through fire. Experiencing the power of resurrection. And ultimately experiencing the resurrection of his physical body. Forgetting what lies behind. Striving forward to what lies ahead. Paul described maturity as a result of forgetting and striving by the grace of God. Neglecting our natural desire to fix, solve, deliver, cover ourselves and instead actively pursuing faith in suffering and in failure and in hardship. Maturity wasn't, wasn't that the self, it wasn't, maturity was moving away from that response to suffering. That when hard things happen, when humanity begins to peek its ugly head out in our situation, that in maturity we wouldn't bend to self-salvation, to self-salvation, but instead we would bend toward faith and trust in the one who covers us. God wants us to grow up by growing out of religion. By religion, we, can, we simply mean engaging with God outside of faith in Jesus, his finished work and person, typically in our own power and piety. Religion is self-salvation. Religion is self-salvation. Religion is when men choose to save themselves in light of the shortfall between them and the holiness of God. When men out of their own strength, 
and out of their own attempt to be holy, seek to save themselves. We need to grow out of it as a response to our own humanity, our own failure, the failure of others. God has not simply delivered us out of this positionally, this self-salvation, but he's also working to free you from an old mindset that says, I have to save myself. I have to cover myself. I need to cover my own shame. I need to do something before God to make it right. Paul's beginnings were in organized religion like many of us. But the problem of self-salvation fans wider. It is a humanity-wide blindness to the heart of God that pushes us to find our own way through life and save ourselves. It is a human condition. Every body. We value religious activity because we believe that God values it. We believe that it is what We believe that that is what God is looking for. We don't believe that God has truly been satisfied by the blood his son shed as an offering. We don't believe that his blood has truly satisfied the holiness of God. And so we live live as if there is some debt outstanding that we have to pay. We lean toward religion because we don't believe that the love of God can carry the full weight of our humanity. Folks, It's time to trust the love of God. Amen? The love of God can carry the weight of our humanity, our failure, our our insufficiency. It can cover it. We have to forget growing out of religion by actively neglecting our proclivity for it. That means unless we unless we are intentional, We will actively lean back toward religious, self-salvific activities. We must remind ourselves of the gospel every day. Folks, you don't grow out of the gospel. You don't graduate from the gospel. You must be refreshed in the gospel every single day. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, it is the gospel that has delivered me, that I'm standing in now, and that which will ultimately deliver me. It is, a, it is a journey deeper into Jesus, into who he is, and into what he's done. Paul had been delivered from religion. But putting religion down actively putting down that need, that that fear-based reaction was something that had to happen intentionally for Paul and for you and for me. To leave behind responses and values and approaches and philosophies and ideas that lend themselves more to a religion, self-salvation than the grace of Christ. Because when we hold on to what lies behind, it inhibits growth. We lose our direction and our desire our perspective and the satisfaction in our salvation. We do not mature or advance into the promises. There was a generation, the Bible teaches, that died on the borders of promise because their appetites never shifted away from, from Egypt. The Bible says in the book of Numbers that the people under Moses complained. Listen, uh, uh, Numbers 11, I'll start from verse 4. They'd walked with Moses. They'd seen the miracles of God. They'd seen the saving power of God. God had established a testimony in the desert for these people. But verse 4 says this. Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving. And the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic... But now our strength is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna to eat. You know, the f- you know, if we're not careful, we can count the cost of our salvation in the wrong way. What we leave behind as we're sanctified and glorified is justified, sanctified and glorified is nothing in comparison to what lies ahead in God. The Israelites saw the meat, the leeks, and the garlic of Egypt as too high a cost for the freedom that they were experiencing. They mourned the regiment of slavery and resented the uncertainty of faith. See, there is a natural bend toward captivity. There's a natural bend that we have. 
And God has come to liberate that from us today. There's nobody, there's nobody who doesn't struggle this way when we're faced with these things. Paul, Paul literally is saying that as we run the Christian race, our approach to humanity and to the humanity of others must mature. We have to be careful because when we face humanity in our own strength, in our brain power and will, we only compound our own failure. Our natural approach is to create fig leaves to cover our failures because we don't believe he can craft a covering for us by the sacrifice of an innocent life. Genesis chapter 3, the Bible says that man, Adam and Eve, they fell. They fell. They fell. God had placed man in the garden, charged them with one thing, to take care of the garden and the things that were in it. And the Bible says that the serpent came crafty among all the things that God had created. And that serpent spoke to Eve in the presence of her husband. And Eve ate of a tree that God says that she, that, that she ought not to have eaten from. The Bible says that, that Adam ate of it too. And they fell, Adam and Eve, that day. God said that when you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, your eyes will be opened and you'll be as God, knowing good from evil. And in that moment, and, and God also said, and when you eat of it, you'll die. You'll die that day, that very day. And so the Bible says that they ate and their eyes were opened. And for the first time, they perceived that they were naked. For the first time, they perceived that they were lacking, that there was an insufficiency. And their immediate response was to craft for themselves fig leaves to cover their insufficiency and to hide from God. And when we meet our own insufficiency and see our own insufficiency. God is calling us to faith again, to not cover ourselves, but to believe that he can cover us. How we deal with exposure and shame and guilt and blame is tied up in this. To cover ourselves by our own work, that's immaturity rather than to be covered by the work of another. Maturity is to put our full trust and to stand in the covering that God provided. God has provided a sacrifice. You know what I find amazing is the Bible teaches that, that after God had spoken to Eve and spoken to Adam and spoken to the serpent, that he had to put them out of the garden. They'd made their fig leaves, they'd attempted to make their covering. And they had to leave the garden. Adam had to work the ground. Eve's pain in childbirth was greatly multiplied. And there's something that we can almost skip by if we're not careful. God announces in Genesis 3.15 that he will, through the seed of a woman, push back or break the power that had come in through the deception of the devil, the first gospel preached. But there was something that God did that we can almost slip by if we don't see it because this is what they became blind to, Adam and Eve. The Bible says that God fashioned for them skins from an animal to cover them. God fashioned skins to cover them. They'd made their fig leaves. They'd made their attempts to cover their own failure, their own folly. And although God had put them out of the garden, there was something in his heart that said, I still will cover them. There was something in God's heart that they used to know, but they'd become blind to. There was something in God's heart that they'd forgotten that they'd become blind to. God's compassion toward failure, his mercy and his grace, that God would still cover them, church, that God would still cover them. Why would God still cover them? They had failed, they'd disobeyed, they'd rebelled. And yet something out of the compassionate heart of God said, I won't send them out uncovered. I won't send them out without, without a covering, without something that they, that, that they can hide their shame. Can I ask you, church, this morning, what covering could we craft that could compare to the blood of Jesus that hasn't simply covered us? It's washed us. When we start to put our faith in the blood... Again, church, we start to experience the power of the blood over shame, over guilt, over condemnation. What covering is there that we could, that we could, that we could craft 
that could cover ourselves better than the one that God has created through the sacrifice of an innocent life. That God would take an innocent life that God would sacrifice his own son to create a covering for people so that they, they could be delivered once and for all from self-salvation for all time. Once At one point in time, God appeared to take away sins for all time. To take away the need for men, for men and women, for you and for me, to ever fall back into a mentality that says, when I fail, I need to cover it up. To fall back into a mentality that says, rather than hiding in the love of God, I need to hide away from God. The first Adam hid from God. The second Adam hid in God. There was a difference. The first Adam was blind to the compassion, to the heart of the Father. Blinded to it by sin, by failure, by insecurity. And yet here comes Jesus, the second Adam, who finds his refuge in God. And it's for it's that that is sonship, that is maturity, that we would not cover our humanity, but stand in the covering God has fashioned through the death of His own Son. That an innocent life, that it's the, this, the power of the grace of God, that God would cover them in their failure, that God wouldn't wait for penitence, wouldn't wait, wouldn't wait for it, would, wouldn't wouldn't wait for it immediately out of his own heart, fashioned skins, fashioned a covering, covered them. What can we, what could we ever do? What could we ever make that could ever cover us the way that his blood has covered us? Because that blood doesn't just cover us. That blood takes it away. It takes it away. Let me tell you, as long as there is a consciousness of these things, if, as long as you think that you've got to hide it or cover it through religious effort, you will always carry around the condemnation and the guilt and the shame of it. It will push you away from the presence of God and not towards it. Yet the blood of Jesus has washed it away. Washed it away. It is gone. In the economy of God, it is gone. God does not impute your sins to you. God does not impute his sins to you. God, you are able to stand in the presence of God as Christ because Christ stood in the presence of God as us. That's the gospel. That is the gospel. Refresh yourself in this because until we can stand in this in trial, we will always shrink away from the full assurance of faith. Paul said, I am convinced I am persuaded. I know that I know that I know that nothing can separate me from the love of God. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Paul put his full weight in the blood that spoke of better things than the blood of Abel. Full weight in the blood of Jesus, in the covering God provided that takes away the sins of the world. In the economy of God, you stand righteous. That's why Paul said it. Any righteousness other than what comes through faith in this is rubbish. How can I stand before God with my best works covering my humanity? When God shed his blood so that my worst works could be washed away. That's what he's done. That's what he's done. When we, have, when we put our confidence in the blood of Jesus, when we put our confidence in the love of God, there is a, it, is, it is an unshakable joy that floods into our lives. It's the, blo the blood is sufficient. We don't need to hide from the justice of God because we don't believe that it was satisfied at the cross anymore. We don't need to hide. Adam hid because he feared the justice of God, that God would see his failure and God would judge him. We don't need to hide from God like that, fearing the justice of God because it was satisfied on the cross. It was satisfied until there was none left. Until there was none left. None left, church. 
put down self-salvation. Neglect it. First recognize that you have a propensity to run to it. Then neglect it. Have courage to stand in the love of God. Refresh yourself in the person of Jesus and the work of the cross. Again and again and again and again and again. It never gets old. It never gets tired. And if you feel like it's gotten old and tired, you need to hear it again. Amen. When you feel like you, there's some other more technical biblical thing to get, get your, wrap your head around, you need to go back to the cross. You need to go back to the cross, back to the cross again and again and again. Back to the blood again and again and again. That word propitiation is so powerful. It means a sacrifice that has appeased a deity. Appeasement. Appeasement is what happens when I have a big Sunday lunch and I put my sweatpants on and I sit on my couch. I am satisfied. I'm satisfied. God is satisfied for all time through the blood that he asked his son to shed to make remission for sin. God simply doesn't, it, the only legal tender God will accept is faith in his son. That's all confidence is currency this morning, church. Go back to the cross. Refresh yourself in the son. This is maturity. Throw yourself firstly in your mind and then in your life back into Jesus and into the things that pertain to salvation because that will produce the confidence that will cause you to step into promise and experience resurrection life and resurrection power and the, the knowledge of him in suffering to know him in the fire. To know him, oh, that we would know him in the fire. Know him, to know him. Not to know about him. Not to represent him, but to reflect him. To be, to spread the fragrance of him everywhere. In the name of Jesus, God, let us be nothing. Let us, if we are anything at all, let us simply be found at the cross. Let us be found there. Jesus, can we pray together, church? Let's pray together. Let's pray together. Lord, I just pray today, Lord God, for those of us who in our minds, Lord, run again and again back to self-salvation. The problems come in, financial, marital, child-rearing, whatever it is, God, and instead of standing in the love of God, straight away, we're trying to rationalize it, reason it out. We're trying to figure out a way through. We're trying to save ourselves instead of trusting in you. God, change our value system this morning. Change the way we value things so that if it doesn't bring us into conformity with you, Jesus, and if it doesn't produce resurrection life, it's rubbish and we need to put it down. Help us to let go, Lord, of, of these practices, these ideas, these identities, Lord, these things that we're building on that are not you. Help us to go back to faith, the purity of faith and the pursuit of faith in Jesus alone. Give us the confidence to put our full weight on the love of God in the name of Jesus. Amen. Bless you, church.